Friday, mm -hmm. August the 5th, and I'm here at the Athens Regional Library from the Heritage Room speaking with Mr. and Mrs. Bill and Molly Perry King. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to ask you both to tell me some of your experiences during the World War II era, if you would. Um, Mr. King, would you care to? Okay. Uh, of course, I was drafted is the way I got <laughs> You have to have a part of it. Uh, and in 19, in January of 19, Forty-three. Uh, I was drafted and spent a short time in the States in training uh, on the West Coast uh, in the state of Washington, Washington State. And then we had orders to report to uh, an unknown destination, which turned out to be England, about six months later. That was in August of 43. After we reached England and spent a few days getting equipped and so forth, we were assigned to uh, various staging areas that the Army was using and I was sent to Wales, and that's where I met my wife. Uh, I stayed there as uh, at uh, headquarters for the Transportation Corps, uh, which had to do with the movement of troops and supplies throughout uh, the United Kingdom at that time. And I stayed uh, in Abergavenny, Wales, uh, for about, uh, let's see, until July, July of 1944. Uh, during that time, we had uh, asked permission which you had to do in order to get married. But we had not received that permission at that time. So uh, I had to report to London headquarters. That was shortly after the invasion because we were getting set up into across the uh, We didn't receive that permission during that time, of course, I went to France then in late July and we landed uh, at Omaha Beach, which was quiet then, of course, and moved forward uh, and set up temporary headquarters there on the peninsula. To say again, this is after we were rudely interrupted, this is the 5th of August, Friday, with Mr. Bill and Molly Perry King. And Mr. King, please go on. Continue. Okay. Uh, while I was in Normandy, because uh, we had sort of a camp, sleeping on the ground type situation, you know, pup tents and whatever, we spent about uh, oh, a week at the time and we had it. Would, would go forward to another area and set up camp. Uh, and as I mentioned in the beginning, we were in the transport corps. What we actually did was regulate traffic and supplies. Uh, by that, uh, we had a call for uh, petrol uh, for uh, General Patton, which that was the main thing at that time. Was get enough uh, fuel for him to continue his march to his parents. As soon as he broke through and then, of course, <clears throat> and Paris was cleared, uh, our headquarters then set up in Paris and I, I remained there uh, throughout 
the rest of the wall. Uh, life was a little, a little better there, uh, especially. Uh, we stayed, uh, was quartered in uh, the, a dormitory of the University of Paris. Uh, eventually, and prior to that, at a couple of hotels that the Army had taken over. Uh, and in October of 44, I had an opportunity to return to England as a courier. Each day the, the courier plane from our uh, outfit going between London and Paris. So I put my name on the list for that duty. And uh, it came up in, in <clears throat> late October. So I went back to London uh, officially as a courier and called on bride to be told I was in London and that uh, I didn't know whether I'd be able to go to London because things were uh, pretty tight then as far as no leaves at all, you see. Uh, so this was an unofficial leave. Uh, when I got to London, I talked with, uh, well, you tell me how you got me. Well, first of all, he, he leaves out a lot, you know, because he actually, when he went to London from Abergavenny in July, he discovered that our uh, asking permission to marry, and we had to do it in, uh, wasn't it quadruplicate? Everything oh, the yeah. army did was quadruplicate. And so he found that whoever was supposed to handle these things had not handled them. So he had got them signed. Now tell him who signed that, actually signed the marriage permission. Do you remember? Whether he did it personally or not. Well, it was by order of... Uh, by General, order of General Dwight well, David Eisenhower. Well, he was the European commander. Valuable ah, signature so to have. Our, that increased in value. So hey. were my orders to so go So were his orders. Anyway, so I always blame him. You see, <laughs> he got to... That was in July. And so he sent the marriage permission to me by way of, well, the U.S. Army is, is so casual compared to the British Army, it always amuses, you know, people to know the difference because um, Bill's major in Abergavenny received our marriage permission, I suppose, in, in the usual, you know, official mail, so to speak, from reporters, and he got it to me. So uh, all of this, my mother had to sign for me because I was underage. And um, so I kept it, and then he suggested that I go ahead and get a marriage license, because it's not as easy to marry in Britain as it is in America. And um, so you have, to, you have to marry in your, if you're Church of England, which I was, you have to marry within your parish. So I alerted the vicar, and the vicar had also, by the way, christened me sometime before, 18 years before. And um, so he was alerted. Well, when Bill uh, realized that once he got to France, the, the Stars and Stripes ran an article that the only people who would get furloughs from France to Britain would be the ones who were already married, you see, to British girls. So he did a lot. It wasn't just a matter of putting his name on the couriers list. He did a lot of, of um, maneuvering, I suspect, behind the scenes. Anyway, he came to London and I got a call from his major, actually, because he called through the army and said, you know, can you be in London this morning because he's going to be there. And I come from a family and I'm, it, it amuses my sons to hear this. I was 18 and I was engaged to be married, but my mother said, you know, you really don't go to London by yourself to meet your fiance. So I persuaded my oldest sister 
to accompany me, and we did, and we met him. And what he skips is that the colonel, who had to give him verbal permission, was at a cocktail party. So Bill knew his English secretary, who she was, and her name was Peggy Simpson. We keep running into the same types of names throughout our married history. And so Peggy knew where the colonel was. And so she got hold of him, and Bill talked with him, and he gave him verbal permission to leave London. But he also warned him if the MPs were to ask him for his papers, they said Paris. So you see, and the colonel was already, you know, backing away somewhat, covering his own uh, responsibility for giving verbal permission. And uh, so we went down on the night train, and that was during the time when the buzz bombs were coming over. Well, there still were air raids, but the V-bombs were, you know, that was the, the uh, unmanned missile rockets. rockets were coming over. And so to travel 150 miles from London to Wales, uh, it took us all night, eight hours, because every time there was, you know, planes going over the train, if there was a tunnel, would pull in, and everything would, would be quiet, because they, of course, planes of all nations follow railways and railway tracks, you know, and follow trains, because uh, these were steam trains, so, the, you know, naturally there was a glow, so they could follow them, you see, and, and sometimes they followed them in order to do some damage to the tracks. So, anyway, we got to Abergavenny at 8 in the morning, and my sister-in-law and I, we lived just around the corner from the vicarage. So she and I popped around to the vicarage and said to Canon Davies that he was here and he'd have to leave that afternoon. And he said, well, of course, it's All Saints Day, November 1st. It's a busy day in the church. He said, so be at the church at 10, no fashionable late bride. You know, it was traditional that the bride was always a little late in Britain. And so we were married at 10, and uh, Bill caught, let's see, the Major sent his Jeep for you about 5.30 in the afternoon, and he was in Newport catching the London train that evening. And then he was in London, and I think you spent the, where, at the YMCA or something? Or the Red Cross. Red Cross, <laughs> anyway. And he was back in France. In the meantime, Peggy Simpson had also persuaded her boyfriend, who was a tech sergeant, he was a staff sergeant, to fly back to France in his place. So that it would give him that much. So we had a lot of help, but before, we're getting ahead of my war, because my war, as I said, began on September 3rd, 1939, and I was 13. If we may then, may, may I hear about the war as you knew it from 1939? All right, well, we, my, my father and I were walking through the local park in Abergavenny. It's called Bailey's Park. And the church bells started to toll. They, they weren't ringing, they were tolling, as if for a funeral. And so Daddy said, we'd better get home. Obviously, there was going to be an announcement. We already was aware. You know, we were sort of alerted to this. So we went home and turned on the wireless as we called it, and uh, we heard the, you know, the declaration of war. And of course, immediately, uh, because we'd had this sort of year of phony peace, you remember Mr. Chamberlain and his peace in our time, well, we'd ha he did buy a year for Britain. I realize he's not looked upon with a great deal of, of um, you know, well, I suppose in a way he's, he's considered a, a a wimp, but he did buy a year for Britain, and, and Britain needed that year. As it, we found out, we needed a lot more than one year. But anyway, uh, the blackout curtains had to immediately be put up to the windows. And of course, everyone, you know, the whole thing started. We were all measured for gas masks. The babies had a special kind that uh, you had to place the baby inside, and then someone had to literally pump air, which I always thought was a bit foolish, because suppose the mother fainted or something, you know, the baby could stifle. 
anyway, I was in school at the time. I went to a girls' school. And um, so we had certain things that we had to do because the school was, was of course, uh, could have been, you know, I mean, with a, a wide uh, green space around it might very well have been a target, you know, could tell. You didn't know exactly what to expect. But we all knew that we were in the path of the bombers. We weren't necessarily a target, but we would be in the path because from, uh, since the Germans would come across the coast, they would also head for the Midlands, which is the industrial area of Britain, and they would have to cross Wales to get there. So we all knew that, so we started the air raid drills and in school and everything else, you know, and, and uh, the, I think the whole country sort of geared up. And of course, rationing came into being, and my school, um, I, we were out with the various, you know, little drone jobs where you had to stamp things, you know, so the whole area was mobilized. And you were 13 in 1939? Were you scared? I don't think so. I think there was a certain, I suppose you have to be young to, to not feel. I'm, I'm sure my parents felt a certain, you know, fear. My brothers, two of whom had already volunteered, no, three actually, because they wanted to choose their service. They didn't all want to be in the army. So five, my five brothers were in it and then started the evacuees and Wales was um, inundated by uh, evacuees from London and Dover and um, Folkestone and Birmingham and my father at the time was terminally ill but it didn't take us off the list because we had because we had a large family we had a fairly large house so we were told that we could accommodate four evacuees. Now, you didn't get any choice, you understand. It was simply that the uh, person in charge would bring these bedraggled uh, children and adults, too, for that matter, to your house and say, well, you know, these are your evacuees, and you might very well have them for years. Now, in our case, we had um, three sisters from Birmingham, and these children were really from the worst possible part of Birmingham. I mean, they were, uh, you know, children who had been uh, neglected a great deal of their lives. They weren't used to, you know, being in a, a relatively civilized home. So as a result, my mother had a lot to put up with. <laughs> How long were the three girls with your family? Well, they were there until my father's doctor objected strenuously to having this and put upon my mother since he was ill. And then we had, because the air aids intensified, uh, even though we were on the list of people who had to have evacuees only under the worst possible, you know, emergency condition, then we had two young boys for a while. But we were not. Uh, because Daddy was ill, um, and his doctor had, had simply told the um, the evacuee um, officer that that it was unfair with five, you know, sons serving on active duty. He felt that the least they could do would be to uh, make it a little easier on my mother, because of course these were young children. You understand? <laughs> you know, they were not, and um, so. As I said, life went on. Um, when I, on my 60th birthday, I had to register for um, national service. And um, the only way I could get, and, and quite frankly, my mo mother was not keen on the idea of my going in to any of the services at 17. I had to register at 16. And so um, I could have gotten out of it anyway by going in for teacher's training, but I don't have the patience to be a, tra a teacher. And um, so uh, my brothers, meantime, were home and saying, you know, I think en enough of our family, you know, are in the uh, armed services and, and 
they didn't want their youngest sister to be in it too. So I know this sounds probably unpatriotic, but it's very, this is the norm, you know. Um, and, and if it happened over here and young women were put into the draft as well as young men, I can assure you there would be a great number of families who would pull all kinds of strings not to let them go. It sounds great, it just isn't that good, you know, because uh, the training period was, was quite rough, actually. Anyway, uh, I, by this time I had my uh, Central Welsh Board certificate from the uh, University of Wales at 15, and uh, I did stay on dabbling in. I, I, I still didn't want to be a teacher, and Aberystwyth, the University of Wales, uh, Aberystwyth campus was closed because it was on the coast and I could have gone to Cardiff which was 30 miles away and I had been taking courses through my school anyway because it was uh, uh, sort of academically it was um, somewhat advanced and so uh, my mother decided that the bank manager said that he needed to replace 15 men in the bank, and the bank wanted five uh, females to replace them. I've always been amused at that ratio. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went in the bank, and I worked at the bank, and that's when I met him. I was 17, and he was 20. And we met at a headquarters dance, as a matter of fact. I went with the, to the ball with a Welsh lieutenant and I went home with an American star sergeant. Do you remember who the band was playing at the dance or if they were Well the band or? was probably was it, it that was the same one it played every week. It mm -hmm. played every week. It's anyway a local, local the thing was Bill like, David band, the Welsh lieutenant that I went with was called you you know if you went to the movies or anything there would be a strip across the bottom of the film saying headquarters star or so, such and such a group report for duty. I mean, you never knew, you know, if you were going to see the whole movie with the same person. So he was recalled, as a matter of fact. And Bill, um, since he was in the same general unit, Bill was liaison with the British, as a matter of fact. I mean, there weren't, there wasn't a whole big, you know, Americans there. And so he offered to see me home and, um, I always thought there was a little bit of manipulation there, but he wouldn't admit it for the world. So anyway, that's how we met. <laughs> now, did the Americans come in that year or in 1942? Actually, or? engineers came in 1942. There were there were American engineers at Lover in 1942. Now, don't ask me why the engineers came no way of knowing, but his unit was the sort of early unit compared to a lot of others who came later because your unit well, had... Some came in 43. Yeah, your unit yeah. had to bring them in, yeah, though. We came in 44. I mean, you're, you're... No, you came... Yeah, you came in 44. No, you didn't, darling. You came in 43. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, his unit, you see, actually did all the logistics for bringing them in and moving them around, you know, because that, that's what the Transportation Corps does. Well, Mr. Kim, were you in until the end at yeah. uh, the V Day in Berlin? When did you, right. how, how long did you spend in the service? Uh, so I stayed in, uh, stayed uh, in Paris until uh, November. In fact, I had Thanksgiving dinner at the uh, uh, port of Le Havre. That was 19, 1945. And uh, we had Thanksgiving there and then we boarded ship and came to uh, New York and uh, they sent me to uh, Camp Gordon in Augusta for discharge. And that was uh, in December, early December. So I was back home before Christmas. And out uh, in 1945. Well, then how did how did um, you arrange for Mrs. King? Well, I had a lot of uh, paperwork to do on that because 
you know, the Army never does anything unless it does it triplicate or quadruplicate. So Bill uh, came home to Britain on furlough and said, you'd better start, you know, he asking for the forms. Well, first of all, I had to write the American Embassy because uh, I thought naturally I'd need a visa. Passport and um, found out what I had to do, applied for transportation. And then after I did all of this with the visa business and having to have a physical, and at that time, and I think that it's still on the books, by the way, if you wanted to get into the United States, you had to have a clear uh, x-ray of your lungs. I think perhaps they should, you know, reinstate that. We might have less problems. But um, after going through all of that, then Mr. Truman, bless his heart, decided that all war brides from Britain would be allowed into the United States, and the con he asked the Congress to lift the visa requirements. So after I went through all of this red tape, you know, it, and it was red tape, then um, he was back in, in Georgia in December of 1945, and I was notified in February to arrive at Tidworth uh, staging area, and that had been a very big staging area for the American Army, and be ready to leave for the United States. So uh, it's on the Salisbury Plain, Tidworth. It's in Wiltshire. And so I went to Tidworth and spent two or three days. It was snowing terribly that year. They had the worst snow in Britain in the beginning of 1946 that they'd had for a century. And uh, we finally got on the train and got to Southampton and got on a ship called the SS Brazil. And so she wasn't a regular troop ship, by the way. She was considered to be a war brides ship. How many war brides were aboard that ship? Too many. <laughs> Uh, babies too, by the way. Lots of babies. Anyway, um, I realized what a very mixed group we were when, when we got to on board ship. And um, as we were going out from Southampton and Land's End was coming up, so they said, we passed a British troop ship coming in from the Far East. And there were prisoners, you know, Jap people who had been prisoners of war of the Japanese for years. And so the, how, how uh, sailors still have sort of an archaic method sometimes of finding out what they want to know with a loudspeaker thing. And so the voice came across the water, you know, uh, what ship are you and where are you bound? And an American voice answered, we're the SS Brazil. We're bound for New York with, uh, you know, war brides, British war brides. And the, the, the British war troop ship, you know, everyone was at the, the, the uh, rail. And over the water came this long, mournful cry, why didn't you wait? <laughs> so that was our fair. I must say, I thought it was a bit, of course I was, I was 19, and it was a bit silly to get so worked up, because I said to the girl who was standing next to me sobbing, I said, do you know anyone on that ship? And she said, no. And I said, then why do you let it bother you? But she was feeling pangs of homesickness, I guess, so almost anything would have made her cry. But uh, anyway, that's what we heard. Sounds like quite a tumult. <laughs> And of course, what the, uh, I thought it was terribly funny. I appreciated the American sense of humor because the captain immediately ran up, you know, whatever that line is, they put the flags, a <laughs> row of diapers. <laughs> so, I thought, you know, it was rubbing it in a bit. But, uh, you know, because the, the, British did, the British men did not like it that so many British women married Americans. I mean, that's what the whole point was. You know, why didn't you wait? Was well, that, sure. Was that very thing. So we landed in New York. It took us 12 days. 
because we had to go four days out of our way to try to miss a gale, which we kept meeting. You know, I mean, the storm in the North Atlantic kept sort of veering away and moving towards us. So it was, it was fairly rough. And um, I got to dislike a lot of, of uh, <laughs> English women. I'm Welsh, by the way. <laughs> because they, they uh, some of them rather wanted free babysitting, you know. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have any children, and this girl was who was uh, RAF, WRAF, Women's RAF, and I would sit up in the library and hide because the Red Cross workers were always wanting us to do things for these, uh, you know, women and children, and they were quite capable of doing it themselves. I mean, you know, I just was not. They thought that, that we should all sort of... I realized then that Americans have that tendency to, you know, want to bring everyone into the same, and we weren't doing it that way. It was not our cup of tea, so we hid in the library. When were you and Mr. King reunited? When were you and your husband? I came down from New York Together. by March train. Well. Landed in Colbert, Georgia, March the 12th, on your mother's birthday, 46. 1946. We've been in Athens since September of 1946, and on November 1st this year, we will celebrate our golden wedding anniversary. We will have been married 50 years. Congratulations. Thank you. You see, they said it wouldn't last. I was 18 and he was 21. Mr. King, what have you been doing since your time in the Army? What uh, well, I started uh, with the bank, CNS Bank, in 46, and I stayed there for 37 years and retired uh, uh, February 1st of 83. Since then, I've oh, tell been on him. playing tell golf. Tell him you've been playing golf every day. Are you a good golfer? <laughs> yes, he's a good well, golfer. Well, yes, you fair. are. And your children, you've raised how many kids? Three sons. The oldest is 41. He was born in 1952. Um, Jonathan, that's Bill. Jonathan is 37 and Timothy is 34. And Bill has uh, a son and daughter. And Jonathan has three daughters and Timothy is unmarried. Um, I tend to ask this question last. Um, I, I tend to sum up these interviews asking people if they were speaking to younger people, to younger generation, about the, the experiences of the World War II era and, and your generation, how would you leave people thinking about that time? Is there one, one way you'd, you'd like them to especially remember your experiences? Uh. Well, as it's, it's, uh, Archie Bunker would say, World War II was probably the, the last of the good wars. Uh, I, I suppose that's because it was run like uh, civilian, by civilians really, because so much of the uh, Army staff, you know, were drafted and volunteered, whatever. Uh, so it was unlike what you would now find uh, as far as regimentation and things of that, that nature. I know there's a girl came over from Paris last year to interview people for, for the D-Day anniversary this June. And my son being with the newspaper in Atlanta, she had, she went to the general constitution. And he said, well, my dad lives down in Athens. Maybe you'd like to talk with him. Uh, so she called up, made a point, and came over. And uh, so at the end of her interview, she said, uh, were you afraid? Uh, what was your feeling when you found out that you were going to have to go? overseas or be involved with World War II. And I told her, I said, well, at the time, uh, 
is this something I had to do, but as it turned out, uh, it was a great adventure for me because of things that happened uh, that affected the rest of my life. You know. And I would say, and I mean this, that I told you I was 13 when the war began. My group in school were in charge of what they called movement control every Saturday night. Now we sat in an office and we received the incoming calls from the various uh, police areas stating, well, the bombers have crossed the, the coastline. They are heading for Birmingham. And it was on our say-so as to whether the local air raid wardens put the siren on. I was 13. Can you imagine a 13-year-old being given that kind of responsibility? I think our generation had a built-in sense of duty and responsibility. And I think that's one reason that we were, we were all, you know, much more mature than our years. I think that I would not have, have thought, for instance, if I had an 18-year-old daughter uh, of this era, that she would be ready to marry. But now my mother, who was a very sensible, very wonderful woman, really had no kinds of, of qualms because, first of all, she loved him very much, and he it was very, you know, upright and all the nice things that a son-in-law is supposed to be. But she really did, she felt that I had a sense of responsibility, a sense of duty, and a sense of commitment. And I'm not terribly sure that, that you could say that about the generations since World War II. I think that it's all been just a tad too easy to get into things and get out of them. And I think perhaps our generation did go into things with our eyes open. And when Bill calls it a good war, well, of course, at least we knew what the whole point was. And that was that Nazi Germany could not be allowed to rule the world. And now it's all so, you know, vague and, and the commitment is not there. And I really think that that's the difference between our generation and the present one is that, that um, I don't see the same, I, I guess duty is, is now a dirty word, but it wasn't when I was growing up. You know, one did things because it was required and it was expected and uh, you obeyed rules and you obeyed laws because uh, they made sense. I mean, I, I, I wore a school uniform. That, and I was very proud of it, and I, I really think now, you know, I see children going to school looking like unmade beds, and I keep wondering, how can they be proud? You see, there's got to be a certain pride. Were the words pressure or stress in your vocabulary no. at all in those times? No, I mean, many times we were up all night with air raids, and as I said, we were not a major uh, you know, I don't think the Germans said, oh, wow, there's Abbey Gavani, we'll bomb it tonight. But we were on the bomber's path. And lots of times when bombers can't make their target, they will turn and go back the way they came and jettison their bombs wherever they, because they need to make altitude. We are surrounded by the foothills of the Brecon Beacons. So a lot of times we did get bombed, not because we were important, but because some German pilot wanted to rise above some of the, you know, the hills and the mountains and get the heck out of there. That was the, you know, and so, and we had a lot of fire bombs and, and I was on duty at school. You know, 13, 14 and 15 with buckets of sand and things, and, and I can't see. I mean, I, what children do today, you know, is appalling. But I don't think they've ever been given the idea that somehow you are responsible somewhere along the way for what you do. Have you been back to Wales? Oh yes, yes, we've been back quite often. Since I retired. Especially since you retired. I took my About oldest... About every other year, uh, every third yeah. year or something. Like I took my so. oldest son home and he had his third birthday in Wales and uh, uh, they're very, um, well I think perhaps 
fully aware of their Welsh heritage, because I certainly am. And uh, it's not that I'm a hyphenated American, by the way. I became an American in 1957 after taking my son home and saying to my mother, you want to see his American passport? And she said, where's yours? And I said, well, I'm still on a British passport. I said, I thought maybe you would prefer it that way. And she said, no, you're married to an American. You have an American son. You live in America. And I think you owe it to your new country. So you see, there again, there's the obligation there. And so I came back and immediately started, you know, working towards citizenship. And uh, I'm, I'm more of a political activist than Bill is, but um, we always vote. We feel that that's not just a right, it's a privilege. I, I think the, one of the main things that uh, uh, made World War II turn out as it did, the people, the population, pulled together. People, you know, didn't criticize everything that went on. They, they felt like it had to be done. And as a result, I think that uh, made it sort of stand out compared to uh, conflict since that time, where there's always been uh, split the population, that, you know, not backing it. They didn't believe in it. They didn't think it should happen. And another group, uh, you know. So I, I think in, in, in that day, that was the main thing. People and think about, think about this in Britain, that people were sleeping in the underground, you know, where the tubes are, the, the subway, every night for years. There were no riots. We were rationed to the point where you would have thought it was ridiculous. You could put the rations for a week for one person on a paper plate, and I don't mean a large paper plate, you know, I mean a relatively small one. Um, we were rationed for clothes. I mean, everyone walked because heaven knows you weren't going to get any petrol, you know, I mean, everyone volunteered for things. That's where Meals on Wheels began, was in Britain during the war. Uh, there was a a coming together. Of course, I realized Britain was, at that point was more homogeneous than it is now. I mean, despite the fact we have English, Welsh, and, and Scots, and Northern Irish. I mean, they, they were a cohesive group. But the thing was, you could walk down the street at midnight in a blacked out town and never fear. I mean, that tells you something about then and now. There really were not the, the horrendous crimes that people might have thought. I mean blackout, absolute blackout. No street lights, you know, you could, you, in fact, if someone stopped and lit a match to light a cigarette, uh, one of the on-duty policemen or air aid wardens might very well tell you to put it out. You know, me, because even though the planes were not as, as technically advanced as they are today, you'd be amazed you know, how they can detect light. And so, I mean, it was, it was, you felt very safe. I mean, it, I don't feel safe anymore. I really do not. I went to, to Atlanta to go to a concert of a Welsh choir with my daughter in law last year. And I felt so uneasy being, you know, in downtown Atlanta, of course she's there, she works in newspapers, so she is, you know, frequently in downtown Atlanta, but I felt very uneasy. And I never felt that way. I, in London or, or Cardiff or, or my hometown, you could go in the blackout. The only thing you risk was breaking your neck over the curb, you know, because you had to remember that you would reach a, a curb <laughs> and you had in order to cross the street. But you couldn't see it. You couldn't see it. You had to feel for it, really. And the, the you know, the, the car lights, the headlights had just, they had to tape it. So there was just the faintest. How often second. would you visit London in those days? Oh, I didn't do the war except yes. to meet him. Um, but, I, but I did have, um, you know, cousins there. I didn't realize that, that uh, I could have gone more often, I suppose. There wasn't any need. I went to Cardiff, which is the capital of Wales, and it's a large city. 
And uh, because when we were rationed for clothes, you spent your clothing coupons very carefully. How, how, uh, how did that ration system work in your hometown? Beautifully. Really. I did mean, you want for anything? Did you, were you? Well, fortunately, we're surrounded, uh, Abergrani is, is surrounded by agricultural area. And what size is the town? Well, now it's probably about 16,000. I think during the war it might have been, might have reached 12. A lot of English have come into Wales, you know. Before we quit, would you just tell me a few words about um, your experience before the war? Um, Mr. King, were you, were you here in Athens before uh, the war, or? I lived in Madison County, is John County. Comer? Uh, Colbert. Colbert. Between Colbert and Danielsville. Mm -hmm. The rural area and uh, on the farm. Uh, stayed, but I went to school at Colbert. At, at that time, we had a high school there. Uh, and then I attended uh, college, business college here in Athens after that, and uh, was employed uh, in the uh, superintendent of schools for Madison County at the time I was uh, drafted to the Army in 42, 43. Do you recall where you were when uh, Pearl Harbor, when, when December 7th, 41 was? Uh, not particularly, uh, but uh, I remember the day very well, but uh, it, uh... Oh, I remember it. I remember it because my father, who, as I said, had, had cancer, uh, came upstairs and said to me, the Americans are in with us now. And there was a feeling of, of great relief in a way because despite land lease and all that, you know, we were alone. I mean, when Fran France gave up the ghost, you know, we were totally alone. And um, it was nice to know that, that, as they used to call Americans, our cousins across the sea, were going to be in with us all the way. So, and, and I have discovered with relatives, for instance, that my generation and World War II generation, older and younger, are very pro-American. Now, the post-war young people are, are perhaps envious, so as a result, there, there's a little more hostility in every European country from the post-war generations. And there were, I mean, World War II generations, you, what you saw on the D-Day, you know, the celebrations, I think was absolutely genuine. It was, it was not fake. They really did, you know, uh, appreciate America. I mean, they, they weren't just telling us that. They really did. And I know the British did. I remember that, that contributing some money to a, I think there's a plaque, at least in Westminster Abbey, uh, that's dedicated to the American troops of World War II. And I know that, that all over Britain, uh, you know, there have been uh, cases where um, Americans have, have been welcomed back. And as I said, there, there is a pro-American bias in World War II generation. I don't think, I think that the the younger ones, it's, it's more a um, matter of perhaps materialistic envy. And really hear about World War II, you know. They really don't. I mean, you know, my children did, and they always want to know about our, the, my son, oldest son said he didn't realize that his dad could be so romantic about <laughs> his volunteer, <laughs> volunteering for courier duty. And I said, but you see, you didn't know me at 18 and you didn't know him at 21. We never do. Well, I'm you know. really grateful to have had the chance to meet you today. And thank you for spending some time. Oh, we were delighted. Mm -hmm. I'm going to cut the tape off, but I want to thank you again.